Before you're seated, why don't you turn to somebody, tell them how glad you are that they are here. Then you may be seated. I will not see you here next Sunday. Okay, good. We understand each other, right? We won't be here next Sunday. Where are we going to be? TCU. TCU. Together with whom? The whole diocese. Now, I would like for you to welcome your brothers and sisters, your family from the other parishes in the diocese with a, a welcome as warm as you did, gave each other earlier, okay? Yung kung pwede, yung ngiting aso, right? Make them feel welcome. Like, by the way, I see uh, Ayi Lau and family here, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoy your stay in the warm, tropical country called the Philippines. But bless your brothers and sisters here next, uh, not here, but at TCU, next Sunday, okay? Rare opportunity, we're going to do that uh, once or twice a year. This year, we've scheduled it for uh, twice, we'll have a diocesan gathering twice this year, but the reason we're gathering next week is so we can commemorate our reception into the one, officially, into the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Okay, that really is the original <clears throat> date. And it so happens this year, it falls on a Sunday. Genesis chapter 18. You know, I still cannot fathom, cannot understand the mercy of God. How can you, if you're human, and you're trying to understand something that is eternal, Right? The mercy of the Lord is everlasting, we say. And we should be ng everlasting. What is infinite? I'll give you an example of what infinity is. Infinity is space. Can you imagine us being human beings born into the world where everything has a beginning and an end? Can you imagine if there is a wall on this side of, the, of space and then there's a boundary on the other side? Is there? How can our minds fathom that? How? How can you fathom a God who does not have a beginning? Can you, can you, I mean, can our minds reach that far? Or an end? I mean, some things must have a beginning, must have an end. That's what our minds tell us, right? So God is infinite. And our minds, which just if we are honest about it, our minds cannot really fathom that. Think about His mercy now. His mercy is everlasting. His mercies never come to an end. How can that be? How, how can we fit that into this, however big your, your brain is? <laughs> how can you fit, in, fit it there? It's like this, uh, I think it was St. Augustine, uh, chancing upon uh, this boy who dug a, a hole in the sand on the beach and then transferring the water of the ocean into his hole. That's how vain our attempt would be in trying to contain the infinity of God, including His love, including His mercy, into our minds. We can't. We cannot do that. We only do that by faith. Only by faith. <clears throat> God's justice and God's mercy. You know, uh, I've heard this and I respect it, but <clears throat> people say, Christians say, God is not just the God of mercy. He's also a God of justice. So justice and mercy, right? The thing is this, in, in Genesis chapter 18 and elsewhere in, in the Bible, it seems to me like God, in his conversation with, with uh, Abraham, God was becoming more and more merciful and less and less 
just. Right? Kumbaga, natawaran si Lord eh. Right? He said, uh, he said, the sins of Sodom are exceedingly, that's the, the, the adverb used there, exceedingly uh, sinful, wicked. And I'm coming down to destroy it. And then Abraham interceded and said, what if there's 50 righteous there? Okay, I won't, I won't destroy it. What if there's 45, 40, 30, etc., etc.? Until it, he went down to 10. What if Abraham went on interceding for Sodom? What do you think is the magic number at which God would say, no, nope, it ends here? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, what? I mean, if he started from with 50, tapos natawaran siya hanggang 10, where is justice there? Right? The sins are exceeding, exceedingly great. Now, where is justice? Mercy triumphed over justice. Jesus said, <clears throat> He who denies me before men, I will deny before my Father and before the angels. Right? The first Pope <laughs> denied Jesus three times before he made him Pope or before he made him the leader of the church. Where's justice there? Right? St. Paul killed, I don't know how many, I didn't count, but he was responsible for the death of many Christians, people who served God. What did God do to Paul? Forgave him and used him. Where is justice? Our understanding of justice. Adam. I mean, I've heard, I've heard drunkards <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a drinking session blame Adam for all the woes of mankind. It's true. He was, was responsible for the death of all men. Ever thought of that? Through Adam, all men died. Through Jesus, all men were given life. But through Adam, all men died. What does God do to him? Forgives him. Mercy, everlasting, infinite, new every morning. I don't know that there's a verse that says his justice is everlasting. Mercy is everlasting. Now, again, we can argue back and forth what I'm saying is, when you say if it's, if it, if, if you say if it's, it's infinite, then our minds cannot fathom, fathom it. That's the love and, and mercy of God. And then Adam, I mean, Abraham asked, will you treat the wicked and the righteous alike? He obviously does, right? Because he makes rain to fall on the righteous, and the wicked alike. But Abraham, in his infinite mind, said, oh, far be it from you to do that. Well, far be it from you to understand my everlasting mercy. That's what God would say. So we don't obviously, obviously we don't understand fully the extent of God's mercy. The truth that says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, right? And, and we don't, this is probably why many times we find it hard to forgive. We don't easily forgive. And we need to yet learn of the infinity of God's mercy, which is everlasting. And we just understand by faith. I ask you, you non-electricians, how does, how does that aircon unit work? We know it works, right? We don't understand how it works. I don't know if electricians fully understand it either. <laughs> See? He doesn't. He's, he's an electrical engineer. But we, under, we turn it on, and we're thinking, oh, we will, we will feel comfortable by faith. We know that. 
right? We know that God's mercy is everlasting. We don't know the extent or the fullness of that infinite mercy. And we understand it by faith. Not according to the tradition of men, not according to the understanding of men, as we were warned by Paul in, in his letter to the Colossians, but by faith. Somebody very, very beautifully uh, put it. You may, I don't know if I put it there, but you can copy it if it's written there, but write this down somewhere, okay? Or, or memorize it. Somebody put it this way. God's justice is merciful. And His mercy is just. Galing, no? He is justly merciful and mercifully just. Wow. When I heard that, I thought, man, this man is gifted. Don't, don't quote me on that. That's, those were not my words. But somebody did say that. His justice is merciful. And His mercy is just. He's into, His justice is restorative. Not vengative or vengeful. Mentioned earlier, James chapter 2, verse 13, second part says, His mercy triumphs over judgment. That's why we avail of that mercy. That's why we, if I can put it this way, take advantage of that mercy. Because it's available to us. We keep seeking, we keep knocking, we keep asking for God's goodness. You know, in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives instructions to his disciples to not use meaningless repetition. Because he said many words don't affect God. But he knows what you need before you even ask. Now that would seem like it's uh, contrary to what he's saying now in this portion of the gospel read today. He said, ask, seek, and knock. Actually, it means keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Don't stop. Be constant about it. Because then you will get your answer. Now, it would also look like in the parable that God answers us because He's annoyed, right? Because we pester Him. Like this, this uh, uh, neighbor. Like, yung kumbaga parang sasagutin ko na yung prayer mo para matigil ka na lang. You know, it's, it's not that way. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis is us keep, uh, keeping on with our asking and seeking and knocking. He, God is not just forced to give us an answer. In fact, Jesus said, on the contrary, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father, whose mercy is everlasting how much more he would give you good gifts psalm 138 the end part of the psalm we read earlier says the lord will accomplish what concerns me what concerns us you accomplish it he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it yet he still wants us to pray because he wants us participating in his work. Participating. Prayer is not influencing God by pestering him, by twisting his arm. It is aligning our heart with God's heart so that we become more and more after his own heart. Again, it's not influencing God. It's us aligning ourselves with the will of God, with His desires. Our persistence is not so we get our way. Our persistence is so that God's will is done. If you notice, this portion of the gospel read today, before that, right before that, Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer. And the essence of the Lord's Prayer is, Thy will be done. Why do we pray not so our will is done, but so His will is done. That's what we pray for. We keep asking, 
Not until we get our way, but so we increase in the knowledge and love of God and try to understand His ways. You know, we sing, when I find the joy of reaching your heart, we reach His heart. When my will becomes enthroned in your love, or sometimes our, our lyrics go, when my world becomes enthralled in your love. Same difference, you know. The object is until we reach that, so that our wills are subject to His will. So that our prayers would not be as shallow as, Lord, sana magkaroon ako ng magarang kotse. O may girlfriend na may long legs. Right? Na mukhang, mukhang model ni Belo. You know? Jumping right out of a, a, a Vogue magazine. No. Our prayer is according to His will. Thy will be done. That's why we pray. We keep praying until we're firmly rooted in Him, Colossians says. We take deep root by persistently aligning our hearts and our desires to His. It's through prayer, and of course, meditating on the Word of God. In fact, we pray His Word, right? We accomplish this. Firmly rooted. And then, St. Paul says, Firmly rooted and then being built up. We first take root, take deep root, and then we are built up individually and, of course, as the church. Time and space and matter and events are in His hands. You know, there's, a, there's a different concepts of time. You have chronos, which is the linear, linear time. I mean, like one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Seconds. Seconds become minutes, minutes, hours, hours, days, days, weeks, months, years, centuries, etc. Linear. There is also the kairos concept of time, which simply means the fullness of time. What I mentioned earlier about time, space. Uh, matter, and even events and circumstances, in the fullness of time, those things converge. Those things converge and intersect. Intersect with God's course of action and His invitation for us to participate. Time, space, matter, circumstances converge in the fullness of time. That convergence intersects with, with God's course of action and His invitation to us to participate in that course of action. In the fullness of time, God sent His Son. In the fullness of time, this happened, that happened. It wasn't on July 24, 2016. No, no. In the fullness of God's time. Because He is Lord of all, Acts 17 says. Particularly verses 24 and 26. God is the Lord of all, and He appoints time and boundaries. He says to the sea, Your waters shall go thus far, but no further. Your, your wickedness will only go this far. I will do something about it. Your corrupt president will only go until this far. And I will do something about it. Which is why we rest in God's uh, providence. The word until appears 549 times in the Bible. And many times, the context is, it is God appointed. It's God appointed. He's the Lord of everything. Everything is under His control. So what we do until that, until we occupy, we busy ourselves participating in the work of God. We pray, we keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And so Cathedral of the King particularly, I, 
I deliver this message to us because I believe we need this. This is something we have lost and we need to restore. God is saying to us, we need to go back to developing a lifestyle and a habit of prayer. We used to observe what we would call quiet time. And then we became liturgical. You know what? We blamed liturgy for deadening us. Let me, put it, let me show you another perspective. Liturgy actually gave us more ability. We used to pray the Bible. When we prayed, we would, we would quote scripture. Like, right? Now, a whole wealth of 2,000 years of beautiful prayers, scriptural prayers, in the words of saints, of God's people, is made available to us. Which, which is why we can pray those things too. They're not against the word of God. They're according to the word of God. And that's what we have now. That's why we encourage everyone to do daily office, to do Saturday night vigil. Poke the person beside you and say to them, he's talking to you. Saturday night vigil. Mm -hmm. We didn't stop it. We transferred it to homes. Uh, vigil, you have daily office. Meditation on the Word. How often do you open your Bibles, brothers and sisters? Not condemnation, this is a reminder. You know, one of the church fathers, I'm sure more than one, said, before you go to church on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, read the Gospel, read the readings already, so that when you get there, you can say, Amen. I've read that. that. That's what they said. That's what they instructed. Read the readings before Sunday. You can say amen. The lectionary is for <clears throat> solidarity, for Catholicity, so that all of us will be on the same journey, so that all of us will be reading the same scriptures every day and every Sunday. That's what the lectionary is for too. <clears throat> I'll give you a... a, a Latin phrase, and I don't know if I wrote it there, but I'll give you a Latin phrase which describes what the word Catholic means. In English, it means um, everywhere, always, believed everywhere, always, and by all. Ubique semper et omnibus. It means, that's, that's the meaning of the word Catholic. It's universal. It's, it means Believe by all, always, and everywhere. Because that's the kingdom of God. That's why you had ecumenical councils before, because they were in consensus. Always, at all times, everywhere in the kingdom of God, and by all who are citizens of that kingdom. But let me emphasize this, though. Asking is only one aspect of prayer. Asking is only one aspect. The bigger part is our active participation in our prayer. When we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we participate in that. <clears throat> it is wrong to just lift it all up to God. No, leave it all up to God. No, we have a part. We have a part. We do the seeking, we do the knocking, until we find, until we, the door is open to us. You know, if you have children, you probably have experienced this. <clears throat> you would look for something, uh, say, I don't know, uh, a TV remote control, right? You know children, they, they put it wherever they, they want to put it, uh, under the bed, in the bathroom, or wherever, outside, in the backyard. <clears throat> so you would ask, where's the remote control? And then you get one of your, your children and tell them, look for the remote control. And they would go looking for 10 seconds, and then they will come back to you and say, I can't find it. Right? Sometimes that's us. We don't keep asking. We don't keep seeking. We don't keep knocking. 
we seek for a short while. And then we say, God, I, I can't. No. God says to us, keep doing that. Active participation. Active participation. But it also, of course, still means we depend on the grace of God, right? But we do so until He comes. We occupy until He comes. You know, this is my simple eschatology. Don't be intimidated by that word. It simply means uh, the end of things, okay? My eschatology is this. I believe in the eventual restoration of all things. That's what the Bible says. I believe one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That's what I believe. That's my eschatology. That's the end of all things. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Because man's wickedness is not as infinite as God's mercy. I mean, he has time on his side. He can wait. I mean, tayo mainipin eh. But to him, a day is as a thousand years. God is not slack, but is compassionate and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. And in the end, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We have the privilege of being part of it. Act 